uh, I appreciate you taking this time. It's been uh, it's been pretty exciting here in this group doing some pretty pretty fun interviews. Like last week, we interviewed the president of the Direct Sellers Association, and I'm really excited to have you here because you come at it more from a global perspective, and also you know you've worked in the corporate side of direct sales network marketing companies. So. Um, First of all, I just want to introduce you uh, to everyone here. You're Aaron Weber and you're in uh, Utah. And uh, Aaron, you have a long history. So I basically, I want to preface this a little bit. Working as an employee on the corporate sides, kind of went up through the ranks, uh, became CEO and had an ownership in a company. Uh, then you sold those interests and later returned back to the field in the same company to build a business. Um, tell us a little bit about that story. <laughs> yeah, happy to. I mean, that's the long version, which I won't regale you with, but there's the short version as well. Yeah, I've always been, since I was 14, actually, involved in direct selling. In fact, uh, if I have any fame, one of my claims to fame is I was the first international employee for one of the you know very early direct selling companies in, in uh in their business. I was living in New Zealand at the time and they needed a part-time employee. And so I was it. And that was their first international market. And I was the first employee because that was the full scale of that, uh, that business at the time. So I've always, I grew up, if you will, through my teenage years, my college years, early career with direct selling and the power of that model sort of front and center. And it informed my education, my business experience from that perspective. So I, I wasn't a normal business guy coming into direct selling. I grew up understanding the power of direct selling. And I remember even as a 15, 16 year old looking at these people that had joined that company and I was just the stockroom guy, right? Picking orders and putting herbs and capsules and that sort of stuff and seeing, you know, well, in a, with a teenager, 16, 17 year old mind looking at it and saying, well, all these people started at the same time. They all had the same experience, which was zero in terms of direct selling. They all started with the same um, opportunity, but you know, these three or four seem to have risen to the top. And, and what are the commonalities of, of those three or four people? There was a teacher, I think, a, um, an insurance sales guy, a sort of a serial entrepreneur, and just a guy that had you know worked in salaried roles his whole life up till that point. So four, three or four very different backgrounds, and they all became very successful in this company. And I knew a couple of them well, and got to know the others reasonably well by being the you know the labor at conventions and you know moving boxes of this and shipping them boxes of that. And, and the commonality was they loved people, they loved to work hard, and they were, you know, deliverers of value um, to those that they worked with and for. And as a 16, 17 year old trying to plot your career, you look at that and say, well, I, I can do all that. I mean, you know, that, that, that's something I'm qualified to. I think I can, uh, I think I can play that game. And, uh, and so that bent the arc of my thinking, if you will, in terms of direct selling being a powerful model. You know, fast forward along a, a few years, I got uh, given the opportunity to come and run the international operations for the company I, I'm now with, uh, came in and with all due respect to the way the company was then, they were disastrous. They were, I think, losing more money than they had in sales. Um, and it was just a, a mess. And so to come in and to be a part of a team that remedies that, that turns it around to high growth, high profitability, strong momentum. Um, you know, proud of the fact that our entry into Japan was the single largest entry ever, even to this point, 20 something years later in the history of direct marketing in the number one direct marketing, uh, direct sales country on the planet. Um, long story short, that company was bought, merged with other company, another company formed a new one out of that. Um, owned by a, a European conglomerate that was looking for a North American strategy of which this company was part. Um, it didn't work for them. They managed it poorly. I'd risen by that stage to be sort of responsible for all of the offense, the sales, the marketing, and full profit and loss responsibility internationally. Um, I guess they figured I'd done a good enough job or at least hadn't messed up international. They'd give me more responsibility there. Um, and got to the point where they announced they were going to exit um, their entire North American business, which included us. 
Um, and we just said to them, you know, myself and, and the general counsel at the time said, hey, you know, we don't have the resources maybe that um, some of the other parties you're going to be talking with and are talking with have, but we, we understand this business. We have a passion for it. We, we love the people and what we stand for. You know, consider us as an option, albeit maybe, you know, way down your list of priorities. Um, they initially came back to us, said thanks, but no thanks. Um, we've got some great people we're working with. Um, and if that doesn't work out, we'll probably close it down um, and take the, uh, the tax write-offs because, you know, Europeans think with tax as a high priority for them um, in a high tax jurisdiction. And, 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 you know, I thought that was upsetting. I thought that was wasteful. And so we said, hey, understand, um, you know, we're going to keep working hard here. We're employed to do that. Um, long story short, they came back to us a number of months later when it was clear to them that those that they were negotiating with weren't negotiating in good faith. Um, and they'd done their analysis that, that uh, you know, the, the PR value of closing it down and not um, keeping it open was not worth the, uh, the drama associated with that. So myself and that other gentleman, we, we made a, um, an offer. Um, the 1st of July, they came to us. That was the first day after the no shop period for the people that they were currently working with. They said, we have a report to the analysts on the 15th of July. If you can do a deal between now and then on this basis, then we'll, uh, we'll work with you. So two weeks of no sleep, um, a lot of travel back and forth. Um, and basically, you know, I'm not trying to appear magnanimous here. It was a great opportunity for me and for us, but in large measure, the driver was there as a whole bunch of good people here and a mission that deserves to be fulfilled. Um, uh, you know, and things just take over, a momentum of its own takes over. And so long story short, we got the deal done. Awfully, a lot of hard work, a lot of getting it right. It had been um, left fallow in many cases because of the way they were exiting it for a number of months. We, we had to go to work and uh, you know, mortgaged my soul, if you will, as well as every other asset I had to close that deal. Um, got it done. And then spent, you know, three plus years um, killing myself as CEO and, uh, and doing what needed to get done to begin. I wasn't finished by any means, but begin to get it right, begin to pivot in the right direction, both financially, operationally, as well as culturally DNA. Let them know, let, let, let the good people know that they had a home to stay in and go to work on and invest themselves emotionally and financially in, and we weren't going anywhere. I don't think many people realized how close it came to ceasing to exist. Um, but so it was great to be part of that process. But I, I very quickly learned um, that I am not a corporate CEO type. Um, you know, I'm glad there are people that enjoy budget meetings and negotiating with suppliers and, and you know, arguing with attorneys over this issue or that issue. I'm, I'm glad there are those people that enjoy those things that spring out of bed in the morning for a budget meeting. That just isn't me. Um, I enjoy building stuff. I enjoy fixing stuff. I enjoy building people. I firmly believe the way you grow a business is you grow the people in it and the business grows as a consequence. And so it became very clear to me after a couple of years and, and always being on the road, the airlines loved me, the hotels loved me. I was, you know, staff fleet commander level with airlines and hotels, but I was never home and I was paying a large price uh, personally and from a family perspective. I had some other family issues that went on where I, I came to the point in discussion with uh, my partners at the time. We were, we were refinancing the quick and dirty debt that we'd taken on board to get the deal done to more normalize the balance sheet. It was an opportunity for me to both change lifestyle as well as um, take some chips off the table, as it were. The company was then in good hands. The CEO that came on board as part of the team and as the CEO of the corporation now is vastly better than I at that role. It was clear to me that was the case. And so, you know, I was somewhere between lazy and smart and, uh, and withdrew myself from that process, took a few months to decompress. Um, and it was fascinating to me how many months it did take to decompress when you're full on, you know, Mark three with your hair on fire, living on the edge for the first period of that. And then, you know, being swept away by the momentum of the opportunity thereafter, 
it takes you a long time to uh, come down from that and, and realize that uh, you have other opportunities. And I was approached by a whole bunch of different corporations and opportunities and went and visited with some of them more out of curiosity. But it became clear to me over that six or seven months of decompression that my passion was with this, this company, these people, uh, this opportunity. It also became clear to me that uh, I would much rather be the receiver of a large check than the sender of it. Um, so, you know, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, I've stood in front of, you know, 15, 30, 50,000 people and protested what a great opportunity this was and how they should do this and that. And I inevitably would go back to my hotel room after that and think, well, you know, do I really believe that? You know, I want to operate from a position of integrity. And I'd, I'd always go to sleep, you know, watching CNN in some strange language um, with, yeah, I, I do. And the closing thought to each of those episodes was, well, if you believe it, then why aren't you doing it? You know, you're playing it safe from an expense account. Your, your, your costs are covered. You've got a salary of 401k, all the other nonsense that goes on with corporate life. You don't really enjoy what you're doing and you're encouraging others to do that which you haven't been prepared to do yourself. And so that decompression time and that process time over those six or seven months, I circled back around, met with the then, you know, the then wonderful and still, still CEO of the corporation and said, look, I, I have a passion for this enterprise, for these people. I have an emotional investment, still have the tail of a, phys of a financial investment in it. I want to circle back around and, and play in a space and at a level that I have a passion for and I think some degree of skill set for, though it was yet to be tested. So I, I came back in, um, worked my tail off, I, you know, without blowing my own horn. I, I think I made uh, Diamond, which is a significant rank in the company, in what was then record time. Uh, that was pleasing to me because it, it proved my theory, if you will. And, uh, and here we are, you know, I don't know what it is now, almost 20 years later. Um, love what I'm doing. Um, I, I build people. I am the, with all due respect, the walking personification of um, all that I think I'm good at, or at least not bad at, um, you know, leading people, building them, um, I love the process of building something. I mean, the home I'm sitting in now was a crazy idea that I then poorly, poorly drew on paper, gave to an architect. He drew it properly. You engaged a, a contractor. 18 months later, you're living in your own idea. I love that process of creation, of building something and building someone from either nothing or where they are to where they could be, to where they can and should be, even if they don't see themselves having that possibility. Um, moving people beyond that which they think they're capable of. So that probably went a bit longer than you wanted, Doug, but um, it, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. I have loved every piece of it. I don't want to speak entirely in past tense. Um, it's interesting, even those episodes that don't turn out the way you would like or you'd planned, the glass is always half full. There is, you know, you, you plan on this and then life throws something at you and you decide to zig or zag and uh, you take whatever you did previously, albeit in a different direction and you leverage it in the new direction and you go forward. And if nothing else, you, you, you've paid some tuition as to how to be wiser going forward um, in terms of the future decisions. So it's all good. It's all turned out wonderfully well love my life, love the ability I have to do what I lectured others to do. And now I'm doing it for my own account and, uh, and have a heck of a good time doing it. So that's the, that's the medium sized version. If, if that makes any sense. That was awesome. Uh, you know, you walk the talk, right? So that's, that's what you try and do, right? I mean, you know, it's yeah. all very well to tell others what they should be doing, but if you're not doing it yourself, then it rings kind of hollow somewhat, right? Absolutely. You know, I've known you for quite a few years, Aaron, and you know, you're a man of integrity and, you know, I'm, I feel blessed just to be associated with you. And just even hearing that story, just, it, it's, you know, just to hear those sort of evolution that like we kind of just think companies just start and it's just straight up. Like there's just so much going on behind the scenes that nobody ever really tells those stories. And it's not, especially when you have a, a company that has this such a long, long, you know, multi decades of history, right? No question. And, and, and it's, you know, it, it's just, it's been wonderful to play a small part in that to be, you know, to be there at a few pivot points um, and, you know, contribute to uh, its longevity. You know, I'm not perfect. I mean, I, 
I, I might, you know, I've paid some serious tuition in terms of some of the mistakes I've made along the way. Um, but I, but it all it all ends well. I love where I'm at. I love what I do. The company is so much better served now than what it was when you know little old me, Mr. Amateur, that didn't really enjoy what I was doing, um, was doing it. Um, my family's got to know me again. Um, you know, so yeah. it, it's all good. And uh, that's the approach you have to take in life and in business is, okay, great. That didn't work out exactly as I'd planned. So how can I leverage that and use that for my own good? If nothing else, of learn what not to do because I've paid the price, right? Absolutely. So, and Aaron, all those years that you were, were doing all this, you've served on some pretty high level boards, the World Federation of Direct Selling Association. You were the chairman and stuff. You've got to see you know, not just the journey of this company, but you got to see a, a, an industry at a global level, like to be able yep. to look down and see the whole, um, what insights, what stories can you share that, you know, maybe <laughs> people in, in this group are, are watching this that, you know, the good, bad, the ugly, like that kind of stuff, like. Oh, I could tell you some stories, um, you know, kill your, kill your hair, some of them, but I mean, <laughs> It's all good. I mean, you know, I've done everything in this industry from stockroom boy, you know, operating a type eight encapsulating machine. And interestingly enough, absorbing through my skin, the herbs that I was encapsulating and realizing, hey, these things do what we say they're going to do. <laughs> um, yeah, there was one that was a lower bowel stimulant. It was a great seller. And you'd spend days encapsulating that in the dust filled room. And the, the um, shall we say, the stimulation effect would kick in when all you would do is be you know, absorbing it through, even with gloves and masks and hats, you'd still absorb it through your, you know, around here and, and where, the, where you would sweat, your body would absorb it and the effect would kick in. So, and then, you know, I've operated, as you say, I was on the board of directors of the World Federation of Direct Selling Associations, which is sort of like the UN of, of direct selling. I chaired the USDSA International Council for two terms. I think I've lost track a little bit, but I think the only person ever to do two consecutive terms, um, mostly because I, I guess they figured I did such a poor job the first time, they should repent the second time around. I'm not quite sure. But previous to me, that chairmanship had only been held by, and I'll say the names, Amway or Avon. They took turns chairing that committee. And I'd sat in enough DSA meetings and proffered my opinion and being the resident malcontent sufficient that the, uh, the, the, the CEO of the DSA said, hey, we would like to nominate you to serve on this board, um, serve as chairman of that board. And so, you know, sitting in meetings in Beijing and London and Washington, D.C., watching the industry evolve, watching it struggle with its self-regulation, um, watching it mature. Um, you know, I see the direct selling industry still as somewhat in its adolescence. It still hasn't quite figured out what kind of responsible adult it's going to be in the end. Um, and every industry has to go through that. I mean, I often talk about how franchising as a concept in the U.S. came within two votes in the U.S. Senate of being outlawed as a business model. Yet try and buy a fast food meal or a sandwich or a cup of coffee, coffee from or stay in a motel nowadays that isn't some form of franchise, if not the unit you're in, certainly the, the, the business as a whole. So the industry is going through some transformation. I remember sitting on the, the, the uh, decision board that was the, you know, this company can join the DSA, this company cannot, and, and reviewing the information provided and, and with all due respect, and not mentioning names, being literally horrified by some of the background and the way that some of these companies operated and they ended up not joining the DSA because we, we didn't approve it. Likewise, you know, seeing the good companies that were there and, and the struggles they were having and the way they were trying to overcome, let's be frank, a market perception that in many ways is not accurate of who we are and what we do. Um, and as part of the US the chairmanship of the, of, the, of, the, of the global council of the US DSA and the membership of the board of the World Federation, I, I was the point person negotiating on behalf of those bodies with Mofcom in China for the you know, new direct selling regulations that they were coming out. I, I led that, that uh, delegation. I was the one that met with uh, Deputy Minister Dang of Mofcom you know, in, in, a room in, in a room at the Ministry of Commerce 
that bordered Tiananmen Square. And I remember looking out the window across Tiananmen Square at a big picture of Chairman Mao and thinking, well, this little boy is not in New Zealand anymore. These, these are the big leagues. Um, and wonderful conversations. I, I'll give you the short version. Met with him, took me, you know, three deg five degrees of separation, I think, to get the interview. Up until me, everyone else had tried to do it through the State Department or the fancy law firm or whatever else. And I just figured, I, who do I know that may know someone that may know someone that knows someone I can, I can visit with? So I went the old school grassroots way and finally got an audience with him. He allocated me 30 minutes. I had my translator, he had his translator, and he spent 25 of those 30 minutes berating me as to what, at what an evil industry I was a part of. You know, painted this picture as if we were, you know, you've seen the, the movie Mulan, you know, we were the Hun. We were the ones coming over the wall to take over his land, and it was his job to protect his people from us. And regaled me with, you know, accurate stories of how the industry had misapplied the principles it, it operates under in a way that was damaging and not helpful. And in the end, I, you know, after 25 of the 30 minutes being beat up, you know, he, he turned to me and said, what do you got to say for yourself? And, and the reality is, what can you say other than you're right? Um, when we as an industry have misperformed and operated in, in misalignment with the fundamental principles that we're built on, bad stuff happens. Water, electricity, wonderful things, but when you misuse them, they can be awfully dangerous. But let me tell you a couple of stories about lives that have been transformed when these principles of providing opportunities to people, helping people do more and better than what they thought they could, selling good products to people you know and love and buying them from people you know and love and trust. When that is appropriately applied, let me tell you what can happen. Gave him five minutes worth of that or two and a half minutes because it needed to be translated, finished, and, and he got up and walked out. <laughs> no, no, thank you. No, goodbye. No, we're done. You know, you know, see you later. And I kind of sat there for a few minutes, not knowing what the protocol was or, or what to do and spoke with my translator about, well, you know, what do we do here? And he said, well, I guess we're done then. And so we were preparing to, you know, packing up to leave and sort of quietly sneak out before, you know, being arrested or something. I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> Um, and then his tra Mr. Deng's translator came back and said, would you mind waiting? Mr. Deng will be back shortly. So we waited. Um, and Mr. Deng came back in and two things happened. One is he started speaking English, which was wonderful because it made the conversation that much more productive. And two, he, we began to engage in a very fruitful dialogue relative to how the industry could personify its best practices and fundamentally sound principles in and for China. Um, did I get the regulations to where I would like them to be? No, they still aren't there. I think we're a generation or two of political leadership and, uh, and, and our personification away from that in, in China. I got them better than maybe they would have been, I think, I'd like to think. Um, and I formed a wonderful relationship with Mr. Deng. He, he passed away three or four or five years later from, from cancer and I got to visit him in hospital and we became, you know, good friends. Um, so that experience, wonderful. Um, you know, I also was the point person for establishing the Direct Selling Association in Poland as they as they were beginning to regulate themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And then all the other meetings that go on in terms of self-governance. And uh, I remember having breakfast once with a dozen other members of the board and Mikhail Gorbachev, for example, in the Park Lane Hilton in London and visiting with him and talking about some of the stresses he had had in, in his wonderful leadership of, of um, a country out of constraint and into freedom. And remember thinking, my goodness, I think my life's hard, um, you know, because what one of the gentlemen said to him, he said, well, Mr. Gorbachev, what was the thing that surprised you the most in that whole glass you know, emergence from communism? And he said, well, he said, I think the thing that surprised me the most was that I wasn't assassinated. <laughs> and I remember sitting there thinking, you know, sort of choking on my scrambled eggs over breakfast thinking, holy smoke, I, I think I've got some stress points in my life, but I don't wake up each morning expecting to be assassinated. So long story short, stories coming out my ears, but those are two or three that I think demonstrate, one, that this industry is growing and maturing and, and the, the fact that we intersect with some of those people at those levels, and this is you know, 15, 20 years ago now, um, demonstrates that we're coming out of our own. We're beginning to build a reputation. Um, 
mostly because there are some responsible adult style companies of which I think I'm part of one that is demonstrating to the marketplace that the whole snake oil salesman or fill your garage with pallet loads of whatever, because you got wound up at some meeting at the stinky holiday Inn last night and filled your credit card, buying a pallet load of yak pee or whatever it was, you know, you, you, you we're beginning to demonstrate ourselves and personify the principles in a proper way. So the preponderance of evidence, the weight of perception now is beginning to bend in our favor. Um, and I think we'll follow a very similar course to franchising or to uh, these other more normalized, very accepted business models. It always makes me smile how, you know, people say, well, we're the abnormal ones, yet we have perfect economic alignment. You know, what's good for you, Doug, economically is what's good for me. And so I work for your best interest. Because if you win, I win. If you win, your upline between you and I win. We all win. Yet normal business, the one that supposedly is the gold standard, is my job as your employer is to pay you as little as possible to maximize my yield, but just enough to keep you around and keep you interested, but keep you hungry. Um, and I have to be a fairly magnanimous individual to pay you more because it comes out of my pocket. Um, and we still have some comp plans, if you will, that operate that way, where the upline makes a whole bunch of money in the short term to create those myths and legends. But yet that breakage that goes to the upline erodes over time as their people earn rank and therefore increase their check. And that comes out of the upline's check. And I've got to be a fairly magnanimous upline to celebrate unreservedly my people growing in rank and growing in income when it comes out of my pocket. Um, there's no economic alignment there. So I love the fact that our industry has direct, obvious, consequential economic alignment where we work collectively for individual benefit, but also for each other's benefit in, a, in, in an aligned way. And quotation marks, normal economics, normal business is the antithesis of that. You know, the sports metaphor of Mr. Rockstar Athlete is happy to help his replacement because it helps the team, but not so much that the replacement becomes better than him, right? Yeah. I don't want to do that because then I lose my endorsement from Nike or whatever else. Um, that's not a good way to operate. And, and we've, we've broken that mold. We operate on fundamentally sound, sound economically aligned principles, which are nothing but a blessing to all those involved if it's done properly and well and personifies based on those fundamentally sound principles. Yeah. I've lectured you enough there. I apologize, but uh, well, that's good. We could talk about this for hours. I, I, days. I, those were uh, those were good days. Absolutely. So I want to jump on to the next thing here um, to talk about a little bit about Weber Investments. So you invest in startups and entrepreneurial companies. Is is this in network marketing or like what? Tell us a little bit about this. Um, like, what is this business? Well, thank you. I mean, that that sort of began as a side hustle, to be honest. I mean, you get to the point of this, this industry is very good, very, very good at creating large incomes. You know, that's what we do. That's the myth and legend, right? And, and, and I'm a personification of exactly that. Um, and I don't mean to criticize it, but what it doesn't do many times is build true wealth. Um, you don't, you're not building an asset that, uh, that, you, that you can compound the value of over time. Yes, your distributorship holds some value, but its value is in its ability to generate next month's income. Um, and so with that, and with the fact that sound portfolio theory says that you should be appropriately diversified, I've taken my income and my you know, small expertise and have a small private equity fund where I invest in startups, turnarounds, what I call stage of life opportunities that, that fit my want to build something, want to fix something mentality. I'm, I'm involved in them for you know three to five years. Um, they suit my personality. They round out my portfolio. Um, and so I've been able to leverage my leveraged income, compound my leverage, if you will, in a way that then provides me very satisfying um, emotional returns, um, doing the exact same thing as I do in direct selling, but I'm doing it in building an asset that is then I'm, I exit from. Um, that provides me some nice pops every two or three years uh, that are, I acknowledge, funded by virtue of what I'm doing here. Um, not directly necessarily, but certainly getting to the point where, you know, the, 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 I, the, the whole cool, the cool thing of this is you want to get to the point 
where you are in your your cash flow, your economics are independent even of the primary source of your cash flow or economics. And so when your money earns you more money than you earn in money, then you're in a pretty good place, right? So you can begin to spend the money your money makes as opposed to the money you make. That's when you compound and, and build true wealth. And that that struck me once when I was on a an incentive trip with some of our top distributors. And I'll word it very carefully, but I remember being dismayed. This was a new market. It was growing fast. You know, next month's income was by definition significantly greater than this month's because we were on the momentum curve. And I remember watching these folks. We had about half a day to, to kill between, you know, the cruise ending and the flights uh, taking off. And they went into this giant duty-free shop in Singapore. I remember it. And it was conspicuous consumption. You know, I'm going to buy three of these Gucci things. And then I saw you buy three of them. So I'm going to buy four of them. It also, it, you know, I'm going to get a blue one and a brown one. And it was, I remember thinking, why aren't you folks being a tad smarter? Why aren't you taking this great cash flow that, yes, is sustainable and, yes, is growing and, yes, is real? But why aren't you taking that and using that in a way that can build true compounding asset-based wealth? Um, you know, my fear for them was they were going to have, you know, a few years of great cash flow, start believing their own press releases, and, uh, and, and their ego is going to get in the way. And then, you know, life has a wonderful way of resetting you. And they'd be left with wonderful pictures from the Ferrari they leased and, and a wonderful wardrobe of, you know, designer clothing and some pretty cool photos in their album, but no real underlying asset that they had built using uh, the great blessing of great cash flow and fast growing wealth. And so, yeah, I'm a bit of a conservative guy. I think it's the right thing to do to, you know, live well. I, I like putting cheese on my burgers. I'm, I'm all for that. But I also believe that I have a responsibility to take great cash flow and use it wisely to be a good steward of it. And, and so Weber Investments is my vehicle for that, you know, long range property investment, medium term, you know, higher risk private equity plays. Good news is all of which have, have paid out, at least given me my money back um, as opposed to some return. So most of those, in fact, all of those are outside the direct selling space. I don't want to be competitive with myself. Um, and that's, you know, again, good portfolio theory to uh, diversify across sectors. So I usually have two or three projects going in, in that space. Um, and uh, but my primary focus, my full time attention is as it should be growing the fundamental cash flow stream that makes all of that possible yeah. to the point where you don't need it. You know, and you're not stupid enough to turn it down. You'll take it <laughs> and you'll certainly bank it. Um, and that's a great place to be um, having seen, you know, and we won't do this because we're led by a responsible adult. Um, you know, CEO, but I see too many companies that are here today, you know, huge amount of sizzle, if you will, they last for a season, and then they flame out because there was no steak. And I'm a big believer that if you focus on the steak, you know, you can engineer sizzle from steak, you can't reverse engineer steak from sizzle. Yeah. So there's got to be, you know, to, to extend the metaphor, unfortunately, too far, there's got to be some beef here, there's got to be, it's got to be a genuine, authentic, predictable, sustainable, and therefore compelling business opportunity. And that should always be your first priority because that's the first domino that makes the others uh, fall in the right direction. So, so that's what Weber Investments is about. A bit of an ego play, um, but a great way to uh, compound my uh, compound my interest. Right. So one of the criticisms that, that the industry as a whole gets is that so few make that high level income or significant residual income. What do you think are the blocks to that? Like, well, I have a problem with the criticism on the face of it. Um, you know, if you know, if we extend that logic, then none of our children should play after school sports, um, because most of them, the vast majority of them, aren't going to become professional athletes. So why bother? Um, you know, it's a waste of time. You're not going to become an NSA, NBA superstar. So you know, I'm not going to drive you around in my minivan every Tuesday and Thursday night for your your little league games. You know, your kids play ice hockey. You know, they're not going to become the next Wayne Gretzky. So why do you bother, you know, with that? 
um, yeah, and, and for obvious reasons, there's intrinsic value that they, they learn other skills, um, you know, that they learn to op- work, play well with others, and, and they learn an appreciation for that particular sport and, and, and competition and sport generally. Um, you know, likewise, normal business. Not everyone rises to be the CEO. Not everyone's going to be the next Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. So, so you know, why should I work then? What's the point? Well, the point is y- you, you have opportunity and what you do with it, how you apply it is, is up to you. Um, you have innate abilities and how you choose to extract value from them is, again, up to you. Um, I actually think the the rate of measurable success in this industry is better than what it is in normal large co. You know, a company of 100, 200,000 employees, there's only one CEO, a whole bunch of VPs and whatever else and division presidents, but the, the ratio of I've made it to the masses involved in it is, I actually think, at least equal, if not better in this space than what it is in, in some of those other ones. Um, you know, it's interesting to me when we're children and, and go quiz, you know, some six and seven and eight year olds and ask them what they want to be when they grow up. It's not, you know, I want to be, it is, I want to be a movie star or a you know, pro athlete or, a, you know, an army general or the president or prime minister or whatever else. It's, it's always a dream focused kind of approach. None of them are saying, well, I, I want to work for, you know, from nine to five in some cubicle, or now I want to work from home in my jammies doing business by Zoom, being paid what someone else thinks I'm worth. Yet that's what most people settle for because with all due respect to the educational process and life, it has a wonderful ability to squeeze that ability to dream out of us. And I think one of the great attributes of this business, double-edged sword, is it introduces again and requires of us a measurement of recapturing that ability to dream. Because now I've got a vehicle that maybe I can begin to extract full value of my skill set and, uh, and asset base out of, and the barriers to entry aren't huge. You know, if I want to start another business anywhere else, I've got to drop some serious money, which means I have to have it somewhere, right? And then I, you know, I'm going to come home smelling like French fries after having managed a whole bunch of teenagers in my McDonald's franchise, right? Whereas, you know, the barriers to entry in this industry are much lower. Um, a lot of it's a lot of it's around organizational capital and and personal discipline. The mistakes that many of us make in this industry is we think just because someone signed the application form, all of a sudden they have the inherent disciplines and attributes necessary to be successful in it. And the reality is they don't because they haven't proven that in any other space. That's why they're here. So, you know, a lot of it's about creating the right environment around them to allow them to maintain their own discipline, to be augmented with your support and discipline, um, a learning environment where they can become that which they need to become in order to be successful in this business. And because we're economically aligned, we're interested in doing that with and for them as opposed to being an absentee landlord or boss that just requires it of them and then cast them aside when they, um, when they don't perform. So, yeah, I, I, think we're, we're, I think we're there and I think part of the bad reputation is because we've been a little bit slapdash in terms of the compliant environment we help build around people to be successful. I mean, people don't experience the benefit of our products unless they take the products. Buying the product doesn't give you the benefit. Taking the product gives you the benefit. More importantly, taking the product consistently over time provides the benefit. Well, maybe that advice is the same with signing the application form, right? Signing the application form doesn't guarantee success. Doing what is doing what is proven to be successful, guided by someone who's done it before, who is interested in your success for their and for your reasons, doing that consistently, operating in the environment that creates the, the, light, the higher likelihood of success, just like taking the product, will in just the same way produce the result. And then it's just a question of how much you want to scale that and what, uh, you know, as your dream grows is the realization that, hey, I can actually do something here that I've dreamed of for quite some time. Um, that, that has a transformational experience in people. Um, you know, all too often, I sign a form and I expect miracles to happen, but I don't do anything different than what I've done in the previous 30 years of my life, right? Like I bought the product and it didn't work. Well, you didn't take it. Well, but it didn't work. I'm like, well, of course it didn't work. You know, same thing in the business. If you didn't, don't listen to someone who's paid some tuition 
previously, which you can now benefit from and don't operate within a system that's proven to work and, and don't learn to create new disciplines and habits, then okay, you're gonna likely gonna have the same results you've ever had. And then you'll leave and blame the company or blame me as the upline because I didn't miraculously create results for you. And I get that. Um, the problem has been that many, too many leaders in the past, and we use that word too much as a cliche in this industry, um, have, haven't been the right kind of mentors or leaders for their people. And so some people have left rightfully disillusioned because the promises made weren't kept. So I, I think that's shifting a little bit. We're, we're now getting a few more responsible adults and real business people that have experience in life, not just great platform salesmen that are coming in and mentoring their groups along. You know, the, 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 the leader you work with, Doug, she's great. Um, you know, she is, she is a shepherd, if you will, of good people. And um, that grows teams, that grows businesses, that creates the authentic, genuine, predictable, sustainable business, which therefore becomes compelling because it proves itself over time, not because you've got a slick PR agency putting out press releases about how great you are. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for the lecture, but you can tell that's a sensitive subject to me and what I feel a great deal of passion for. It is. I think we all have passion for that. So Another thing, you use the term called play the long game. You've used, whenever we talk, you've always, so give us sort of that, what, what, what do you mean by that? Like, what does that mean to you? Play the long game. Well, the, the, the best way I can, I can demonstrate that is using two examples. Um, and I acknowledge I'm at a different place in my business than other people that start tomorrow. But, you know, I, I don't sell, for example, our products at retail. I, I just don't. I mean, I, I can make $10 or $15 or $20 on the margin, right? Buy it wholesale, sell it retail. But the personification of play the long game there is I want them as my lifelong business partner because I genuinely believe that's what's best for them. And so I sell all product at wholesale because when the product works and we have that wonderful blessing in, in this company, when the product works, they're gonna to want to share it with others. Others are gonna ask them. They're gonna become a member and they're gonna see then that I gave them the best possible price I could. Or they're gonna see that I wanted to make 10 or $15 for a month or two each month off them. And that's gonna put a wrinkle in our relationship. The value of them is the volume they do over time and my very small percentage on that paid out on the residual part of the comp plan. So I'm not looking to make the $100 or the $30 or the $200. I'll take it, but only if in doing so, I'm also giving them the best possible deal for them. And so I play the long game. I forego the $30 or the $100 because I want one, two, four, six, 12, 25 people's 100 points of volume per month times 5% for the long term. That's what creates my income. I'm building a long term, sustainable, residual leverage business. And so I don't need to try and shortcut that because I need to go buy lunch today and make $30 off you. And then put, therefore put myself in a spot that requires me to have to disclose, I probably could have given you a better deal, but I didn't because you're going to find that out when you want to join with me in a partnership. And if you don't, then that's okay too. It, it's worth the experiment. The other example of which feeds off that is the old compounding of interest, right? If you put $100 a month into a long-term savings account over 40 or 45 years over your working career, you put about $54,000 into that account. If you get a return of 8 10%, which is a little bit high nowadays, but over that period of time probably is accurate, if you're smart and have good advisors, that $54,000 you've put in turns into 1.2 million. That's the power of compound interest. That's the power of starting yesterday rather than tomorrow. If you, if you start a year later, it's 750,000. So you've left half a million dollars on the table by delaying. And if you don't, if not consistent, it creates other variations on that return. So the value of being focused on a year or two or three or five or 10 out is huge and not operating in a way that what's best for me today 
So I operate in a way that's what's best for my people today, this month, this quarter, this year, knowing that the compound effect of that is always in my favor. And I will have strengthened the relationship when they found out that I operated in every regard in their best interests. And we're therefore 100% economically aligned. Those are two examples of what I mean by playing the long game. Um, plus, you know, I'm inherently lazy, right? So I want to operate in a way that sees the return continue so I don't have to do the same work over and over and over. I remember meeting, having a conversation with a great leader of our industry in Singapore. And, and chatting with him and he wanted to come join us. And, and my, my guy that put us together, you know, had worked hard to get him. And I remember saying to him, I, you know, I applaud what you've done, but I don't want you in my business. My guy about fell off his chair because he'd spent months trying to get the two of us together. And this guy said, well, well, why not? I'm very good at what I do. I said, that's why I don't want you in my business because you're very good at what you do. And what you do is you every month create activity income because you're very good at selling and emotionally charging up the crowd and sit into the back of the room to load the credit card up with whatever it was you're selling. I said, I'm teaching a different methodology. I'm operating in a different way. I come from a different gene pool than that. And if I, you joining me will cause a ripple in the industry. And in doing that, I have then sent the signal that everything I've been teaching and trying to personify has just been nothing. You know, I, I'm, I'm just like all the rest of these folks out for the latest deal of the month, out to make the best deal I can, out to personify poorly the principles of the industry. And it was fascinating to me. That was the last evening of, of, the, trip, of the trip there. My guy, you know, settled down a little bit and understood that I was operating from a position of, of consistency and, uh, and properness as opposed to expediency. And it was fascinating to me that the flights from Singapore leave at like 6 a.m. or something or other. And I got a call at 4.30 a.m. because the, the guy knew I'd be up. The next morning, he said, look, he said, if I can adapt my methodology to that which you're teaching and espousing, will you let me join your group? Note the language there. Will you let me join your group? And I said, you bet. I said, if you can, if you can pivot, good luck in the company you're in because there's not great residuals there. That's why you have to do what you have to do. You're getting 90% activity income and 10% residual income. But if you can pivot from that and be seen to pivot in the marketplace, I would welcome you with open arms. Um, sad story is he was never able to pivot because his, his training and his skill set didn't allow him to. The company who was with Comp Plan wasn't built that way. So you play the long game, you operate from fundamentally sound principles, it will always serve you well. Your efforts will compound over time and you will find great success, not just economic success, but huge satisfaction in what you've built and how you've built it and the people you've built and blessed along the way. And that to me is hugely satisfying. Wow. Lots of long answers to your short questions. That's Doug. awesome. I apologize. Uh, I, we got lots of people watching, lots of comments. I'm having a hard time keeping track of them while I'm interacting with you. So um, I think, I think it, lo looking from the comments, the engagement, people are really enjoying it. One of the things you said about, you just say it's better to join yesterday than it is <laughs> next. So the next thing is, I hear this a lot, okay? And I think the, the term people like to call it is that first movers advantage. Oh, they were the first one to join. They were the first one. Oh, they brought it here to this state, province, region. Like they sort of had this advantage that, tell it, talk, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, yeah. The old story of market share happens once, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, calling, um, I'm calling BS on all that. Um, you know, we've been around in this company and I've been around in this industry long enough to see the macro level ebbs and flows. You know, at the moment in, in our company, the largest checks are being generated in Korea and most of those folks have joined in the last six to eight years. I've been, I've been here in this form for 20. I've been involved in the company for 30 plus. You know, the, the big earners that were with us back then are no longer the big earners. They still earn a great residual income. But it's, you know, their, their, their seasons have shifted, their motivations have changed, their um, energy level and proactive input is different, so the returns moderate. I mean, it's a lie. Let's be frank. It is an absolute lie that you can come into this industry, work real hard for three to five years, and retire on the beach in Hawaii forever thereafter. That's a fabrication. 
don't say that. You lose credibility when you say, that. first of all, you go nuts. I've tried it for a, about a week and I go psycho after doing nothing for a week. I need to be engaged in doing something productive. The reality is, yeah, you can build a great residual income, but if you're not doing the, the proper maintenance, continue to prime the pump, being engaged with your people in your business, expect it to slowly decline over time because you're not there maintaining the asset. So we have people that, you know, earned hundreds of thousands a month and now earn tens of thousands a month. They're okay with that because their priorities have shifted. We have folks that didn't exist six, eight, 10 years ago in our business and now are the largest earners in our business in company in countries that we've been in the whole darn time. Um, it's not a function of being first. It's a function of being in today, not tomorrow, and being consistent in your efforts going forward. Play the long game. You know, our, our largest earner right now in Korea had been in the business for three or four years and done not much. And then went to one of our global conventions, saw the personification of what another team in another geography was doing. The penny dropped for him. He went home, made some pivots, made some adjustments, copied and pasted, and then translated both language-wise and culturally-wise what was done over in X in his country. And now he's the largest earner. Um, but he certainly wasn't first. He was like the three millionth to join us in Korea. Um, you know, same thing in the US. We have some rapidly growing in North America earners here in North America that weren't with us two or three years ago. And, and, and they will very quickly eclipse those that were here 30 years ago because of the ebbs and flows of business, the macroeconomic cycles, the life cycles of people. And you know, th this business takes a lot of hard work to build to a certain level. It takes a reasonable amount of diligence to maintain it there. And sometimes people aren't prepared to pay that price. And that's okay because their priorities have shifted. You know, you know, I want to spend more time being grandpa, right? As opposed to on a, on a jet plane flying around the world doing meetings. That's okay. That's a decision I make from a lifestyle perspective, which has an economic consequence. Doesn't mean my income stops. In fact, last summer, I took August off, went and watched my son play um, sports in South America. And summer before last, I should say, summer, last summer we were all locked down, but no, went to Argentina and Uruguay with him, watched him play rugby for the US team. He did well. We went to Disney World. I went hiking and backpacking and camping, basically did nothing for August. Um, came back, you know, cleared a bunch of emails and my check went up. And so my wife looks at me and says, well, you're a complete waste of time then, aren't you? I mean, clearly what you do not only doesn't add value, it actually detracts value. So do less and your income will go up. So not not accurate you know she was looking for a, a wonderful way to give me a hard time right i've built a business that operates independently of me and that's a mistake that too many leaders make they make the business dependent on them because their ego requires it so the conference call can't take place the meeting can't take place unless i'm front and center well i'm as i said i'm inherently lazy so my job is to make myself irrelevant my job is to build people such that they can operate and not need me you know, I go to sleep and better people than me are at work in different parts of the world. And I'm okay with that because that's been my job is to create, create and provide opportunity, so find, build and uh, support good people that can ultimately better than, be better than me. Large number of my income earn more money than me. And I'm just fine with that because the, the work to income ratio in this area the balance that I'm able to achieve in my life in terms of other areas I want to focus on, community service, family, other things like that, um, are therefore, you know, aren't bigger priorities, but they've become larger priorities than they would be if I was having to be Mark III with my hair on fire. And I did do that. I did that as CEO for three years. I did that when I was building this business for seven or eight. Um, but I knew that was the price I had to pay to get to that point. Ha has the growth plateaued for me somewhat? Yeah, it has by design and you know and so i operate now case in point doug you reached out to me i jumped at the opportunity you know i'm active i'm engaged but i do it institutionally yes i'm building new business here and there i'm pro i'm proactive in doing that which i'm asking others to do because that's what i should do i shouldn't be asking you to do anything i'm not doing myself i need to be relevant in the marketplace so i am doing that best thing i can do for my business is always be building new business right 
Yeah. And then I, I, I make myself available institutionally to those that see value, perceive a need, want my particular flavor of input, but large measure have built it in such a way that I'm able to stay out of the way of their operations because hopefully I've been somewhat helpful in helping them build themselves to the level they don't need me. I still want to be wanted. <laughs> I still have an ego. I'm still happy to show up, I'm still happy to play the role still happy to add value, but I don't need to be there for my ego reasons and therefore constrain the upside of my business because of the locus of control that I have or don't have. So laziness has its advantages, Doug. After you've worked your tail off, that's for sure. Yeah. You got to earn it first, right? So, well, we've been at this for almost an hour. Time just goes like that. So I got one more question, Aaron, and then we can kind of, kind of wind it down a little bit. But I've heard you on many occasions that you have a goal to lead the transformation of the direct sales industry. You know, we talked about this in the beginning of our conversation of the sort of the global perspective, the China story, all that kind of stuff. For you, what does that look like? What, what's that transformation? How do you play a, how do you play a role? And maybe, maybe interviews like this is part of playing a role because inside this group, there's multiple companies, people that yeah. represent that are able to hear what you're saying. So. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, take the gestalt of what we've talked talking about, right? I mean, that's it. I mean, the, the reality, let's be frank, the, the industry of which we're a part and our players in has in many cases, thankfully diminishing cases, a less than stellar reputation. You know, thank you competitors for that challenge. But I've learned two things. I've learned that if First of all, I'm not going to change it by being a critic, right? I've got to be a working personification of that which I espouse. And thankfully, it works. And I, and as I observe the industry as a whole, as I have a lot of people come to me saying, hey, I'm liking what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what you're doing. Can I do that too? You know, I, I mentor groups and other companies, for goodness sake. Um, not too much because <laughs> I prefer they be here but I'm trying to grow the whole. I want to get to the point where when someone hears of our industry, the, the reaction isn't one of shock and horror and, you know, go away. Or when someone, you know, takes the, the leap of faith and joins us, they're like, hey, this is not what I thought it was. You know, you're good people. You've got good product. This is good stuff. I, I always smile when someone comes to me with some level of surprise in their face about, hey, this stuff works. And I'm like, of course it does. You don't stay in business for 30 plus years selling snake oil. Um, or, or, hey, you know, you called me back. I'm like, yeah, I said I would. I mean, why is that a surprise to you? <laughs> um, you know, when, when people are no longer surprised that we do what we say we're going to do, we operate in a responsible way, we haven't got horns, we're normal people trying to build a business in a model that is genuine, respectful, honorable, I always use the example of if I see a good movie, I'm happy to recommend it to friends because I want to make their life better. You know, I, I do that for no reason. I don't do that because the movie theater gives me free popcorn next time. I do that because I'm genuine about trying to help them have a good experience. If they go see the movie and they don't like it, I haven't ruined our relationship. Um, they just say, Aaron, you're an idiot. You know, don't, don't refer any more movies to me. You know, you clearly don't get it, but we still have an underlying relationship. That's all we're doing here. We're providing opportunities to people. We're lifting them. We're providing good products that do what we say we're going to do. We're creating positive environments. <clears throat> yeah, we get a bit of free popcorn from time to time from the company for doing what we do. <coughs> but that's complementary to some of the other motives we have for doing it. We enjoy what we do. I love to see people find success at a granular level on the product and get that first bit of income that comes as a complete surprise to them that this comp plan actually works. And oh my goodness, you know, this is actually real. And the more that we can build that critical mass, that this is a normal, um, I think more normal than currently perceived normal business, uh, more honorable, quite frankly, business and begin to outweigh the gamesmanship that still sometimes gets played. You know, good company, great product, solid comp plan, solid people that do what they say they're going to do as that grows as the preponderance of evidence then the perception of the marketplace shifts. And then, uh, you know, from a recruiting perspective, that becomes a lot easier because then you don't have to overcome that resistance. I've also learned though, that the Delta between what people expect and what they actually find actually is what creates the opinion. <clears throat> you know, if I'd heard about you, Doug, and I'd heard you, you know, were a good guy 
and I meet you and you're a good guy, no great memory log there, just you're a good guy. You know, that's what I expected. But if I heard you were, you were the devil himself and you know, that Doug guy is, you know, he's in one of those deals and, you know, stay away from him. Oh, my goodness. And then, you know, for whatever reason, maybe a leap of faith, I get to know you a little bit. And I'm like, Doug's not that way. Doug's a great guy. I like him. That difference between what I expected and what I saw locks in for me a perception that serves me well. Now, I'm not suggesting we should downplay our skill set. We have competitors that certainly do enough bad bad work and damage to our reputation as an industry that when they meet good guys like you and I, they're like, hang on a minute, these guys aren't like I thought they'd be. That shock value in a positive way, that delta between perception and reality, actually, I think is affirming and a positive thing for us. So in some regards, even though I dismiss some of our competitors and I'm dismayed at some of the way they operate, it does make the initial conversation more difficult, but once you can get through that and demonstrate your realness and substantiveness, all of a sudden that creates a lock in in people's minds that hang on a minute, there may be something here. You know, the, the, the Lamborghinis and the hoo-ha and all the rest of the stuff, whatever. But these are real people doing real business, providing real solutions, using real products, and they do what they say they're gonna do. That shouldn't be too hard to operate that way and create that perception. And so being in the ring, being in the arena is, is the way you do that. Um, you know, writing articles and blogging about it from a distance, you know, that's not helpful. So getting your hands dirty, rolling up your sleeves, being the working personification of that which you believe the industry should be. And I'm not perfect in any way, shape or form. Um, that's how you, you know, lead the transformation of an industry. I believe, you know, <clears throat> Last story for you. I remember sitting in a board meeting in Beijing with the board of directors of the USDSA, um, Amway, Avon, Herbalife, you know, you, all the big names were there, right? And I remember watching the way these owners and uh, founders or CEOs operated, wonderful individuals, no criticism whatsoever of them or of their company. So please don't get me wrong. But it was clear to me that they were largely in a high priority for them was protect what they have, um, you know, as, as they should, you know, you, when you've got a lot of billions of dollars at stake, a high priority needs to be protect the institution. But it wasn't how do we grow 4 billion into 8 billion? How do we grow 100 million into 400 million? How do we get upside? And I think that's part of where we're at. I think Unicity or, or us, is well placed with the inherent attributes we have in terms of management, product, heritage, institutional knowledge, because we've got some scar tissue from the marketplace as well as of our own making that allows us to understand how to operate in whatever marketplace we find ourselves, how to overcome those difficulties, how to therefore get achieve the upside that's out there to be had. I believe the industry of the leadership is an empty chair right now. I believe the big names aren't going to be the leaders of the industry in 10 or 20 years. And I'm playing the long game. I believe that a company that is not yet on the radar screen of industry leadership is going to end up leading the industry. Case in point, FedEx didn't invent overnight freight, but they own it. You know, Walmart didn't invent retailing, but they own it. Um, you know, Apple didn't invent the smartphone, but they, you know, partially own it. Google didn't invent internet search, you know. We don't use Alta Vista anymore, who, who invented it. We use Google. In fact, Google is a verb, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not the company or the individual that creates the industry. It's the one that reinvents it that ends up owning it. And I, I operate from that premise. I think we have the potential to lead or be part of the reinvention of an industry by personifying the fundamentally sound principles it's built on in a responsible adult, but yet friendly, happy, and high growth way and end up with some degree of, if not moral leadership, certainly economic leadership in the industry and the space. There you go. That's my summary version. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, um, just over an hour here. Um, I don't know, Aaron, you got any last party comments for, you know, or it's, it's an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship group. I mean, we're all in home-based business. I mean, you know, I, I originally put the group together, you know, tax write-offs, you know, 
around the book and that kind of stuff. But I think there's, there's a side of it that, you know, we need, I want people to do what you're doing, like be, become more professional, understand how do I grow a business? It's not always about how do I pay less tax? I mean, you got to earn income and you got to grow and leadership and stuff like that. So I'm bringing, you know, guests in and uh, I don't know what, what final words or comments could you share with these guys? Well, yeah, two comments. I mean, first of all, you know, the fact you have to pay tax means you're making income, right? Um, but I also come from the, the perspective of, you know, we need to pay our taxes, but we also have a societal responsibility to minimize those taxes wherever possible. And, and this business model certainly gives entree into deductions and abilities in that regard, both generating income and mitigating costs across the board. You know, I run a multi-million dollar corporation from this room. Um, I, I am overhead fixed cost averse, right? But I get to deduct this room and other spaces that I use because I use them for my business. Um, the, the, the advice I would give to entrepreneurs generally is pick a pony and then ride it. Um, do your due diligence, make sure you're picking you know, at least a decent pony. There are some big incomes, big checks being made in all sorts of different companies, all sorts of different opportunities because people picked it and stuck with it. And, and so you pick the pony, do your due diligence, pick a pony and stick with it. The value of compounding, the value of your efforts paying dividends for a long period forward, the value of consistency is huge. And, you know, and to quote Stephen Covey, too many, too many times people are pulling up the plants to see how the roots are going, or <laughs> it's not going exactly as I planned, or you know, someone let me down, so I'm going to you know, jump off this one and get on another one. And the, the economic waste, the momentum waste, the relationship waste, the personal reputation waste that comes from that jumping around, We've had some big people come and join us. We've had some big people come and leave us. And there's some exceptions, but almost universally, people are never successful jumping around. They're mostly proportionately successful by doing their homework, being lucky. But the harder you work, the luckier you get, sticking with that pony and compounding their efforts over time, building their skill set, building their institutional knowledge, building their relationships letting their efforts pay dividends in a compounding way because they consistently apply them. You know, not flash in the pan for 30 days and then, you know, nothing for the next 60. You know, I would much rather someone come in just a little bit every day than, you know, come in looking to set land speed records. It's the compounding of your efforts that makes the difference, not the efforts themselves. We'll take that as the final word. Great. Um, Aaron, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for all your knowledge and, and sharing it with everybody here. It's been, uh, it's been great for me to hear. I, you know, I always enjoy listening to you and, and, and the insights and, uh, and the knowledge. And so. Well, thank you, Doug. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity, the invitation. I, uh, you know, it's a cliche, but I try and work with and for people. And I'm always happy to do that. Uh, I, you know, I love people. I love working with them. I love helping them grow. Um, you know, as business, as my business grows and matures, I get as much satisfaction of seeing someone else's business grow as I do my own, notwithstanding the benefit that accrues to me as a consequence of that. So thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, I guess on that note, we'll sign off. And uh, thanks again. You're most and, welcome. Uh, I'll watch the comments here, but I, I know there's quite a few in there. So we got some great feedback. And I'm sure that we'll get lots of replays on this inside the group and people will get lots of value from our conversation today. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And, you know, I'm here to help. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. Bye-bye.